that. Um, so our program tonight is called The Magnificent Behavior of Shorebirds, and our presenter is Brian Zwiebel. And most of you know Brian, but I'm going to do a quick introduction for him anyway. So uh, Brian began his journey with birds in uh, 1993 by taking an ornithology class. And six years later, he began uh, photographing the subjects he had come to know so well. And since then, he's traveled all over North America to photograph birds. Some of his favorite trips have been to the Arctic and subarctic regions of Alaska and Canada. In June 2007, he spent two weeks photographing tundra nesting, nesting birds at Barrow, Alaska and in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. In 2010, he returned to Barrow to co-lead a photographic workshop and that experience led to the creation of the site guide to Barrow, Alaska. And when he's closer to home, Brian spends a lot of time in May photographing warblers at McGee Marsh, like uh, most of us do also, I think. <laughs> Um, his award-winning photography has been featured in exhibits around Northern Ohio and has been internationally published in various books and magazines. Um, you can find his photography at brianswebelphotography.com. And he's also a co-owner of Saberwing Nature Tours, and you can go to their website and see his uh, upcoming trips there as well. Um, and at the end of this program, after Brian takes some questions, he's going to talk to us a little bit about some talks we've been having with Saberwing about a potential uh, birding trip for TNA. So um, before I let Brian take over, I'm just going to remind you that um, all the participants are muted and you can use that little chat window to type questions uh, during the program and we'll see if Brian can answer them at the end. Um, so Brian, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, despite being a little under the weather, we really appreciate it. Um, so if you're ready, I'll just turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Kim. Hope everyone's uh, doing well and, and maybe doing a little better than, than me right now. I hope my voice holds up for us. Um, but if, if shorebirds were, were simply um, beautiful, that would be reason enough to photograph them. Um, but I've really, over the years, have fallen in love with um, their various behaviors, uh, all the things that, that birds do to, to make, them, uh, make them tick, I guess. And uh, this is just a beautiful American avocet. And like I said, I could do portraits of beautiful birds all day long, but uh, this program is about behavior and um, we'll be looking at, at much more of um, what birds do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, this was my first experience with, with shorebirds when I was new to birding. Um, I couldn't identify them. They were far away. They were often in bad light, silhouetted. Um, I think maybe there's some Dunlin in here, maybe a yellow legs, I don't know. Um, but I didn't, they didn't uh, really catch my eye at first. Uh, tend, tended to ignore them because I had trouble identifying the little peeps. And um, then I started getting uh, wet and muddy and, and uh, working to get close to the, to the birds. And it, it became much easier to, to identify them. And uh, that's where I really started to fall in love with those, uh, with the shorebirds. <clears throat> Um, this is a beautiful Baird Sandpiper up, up at Whitefish Point, and um, I, I couldn't identify those Baird Sandpipers early on. Um, I didn't have them on my list forever, and I simply just didn't know how to identify them, I don't think. Uh, but since that time, I've um, observed them doing an, any number of interesting things like uh, preening and bathing, um, shaking out their feathers after a bath, uh, Giving, giving me a wave on the breeding grounds at Barrow, Alaska. Speed skating. I didn't know sandpipers like to speed skate. Um, not sure what this bear is doing, but it's having a good time. But what I'm showing here is just all the unique and different things that, um, that you can capture the, the shorebirds doing. <clears throat> and Baird's is actually known as, as a grass piper, um, just as likely to be found on... Uh, damp, wet grass versus out in the water and in the mud. Anyway, the, um, the shorebirds have a, a variety of different um, styles of, of bills to help them access different types of prey. Uh, this is a long-billed dowager. It can probe deep into the mud uh, to capture prey. Uh, this is a short-billed dowager uh, doing its sewing machine motion to, to capture um, those invertebrates in the mud. And uh, longer legged shorebirds can, can access uh, bugs in, in deeper water. And they have a flexible bill tip, uh, which will 
Uh, there's actually nerve endings at the tip of the uh, bill and it can it can feel when it uh, intercepts something in the mud and it's had that flexible bill tip will then allow it to capture some of that food. Here we have a woodcock with a big long uh, bill. This is the the non-shore bird, right? It's uh, not like the rest. It's found in the in the woods and and along the edges of <coughs> of uh, successional habitats. Long-billed curlew's got a great big long bill for getting to uh, invertebrates deeper into the mud than any other uh, shorebird can get to. And we've got a red knot that um, will actually forage on zebra mussels and um, red knots and, and other shorebirds will actually uh, regurgitate a pellet of some of the uh, uh, parts of, the, of its food source that it can't digest. Uh, will it will it does the same thing as it's uh, consuming some of the mussels, it's crushing them up and and it's going to regurgitate those back up as pellets, much like an owl or a raptor would. Ruddy turnstones uh, also um, will consume things that they just cannot digest, so they're going to cough those those pieces back up. Uh, this was an interesting situation with a, a group of avocets that. Um, were foraging in shallow water and the lead birds were running along and, and um, not really feeding, they were just moving. And the other birds behind would dip their bills down and, and, and sweep and forage and they would uh, switch roles. The, the rear birds would come to the front and serve to stir up the, um, the different uh, foods, food sources and the other birds would take advantage. Uh, lesser yellow legs uh, will actively pursue um, minnows and tadpoles, different things like that, and, and will actually run rather rapidly through the water with their bill open, uh, acting almost like a like a uh, skimmer and snapping its bill shut uh, once it encounters some food. The uh, the plovers have short bills, and those uh, short bills are more adept uh, at picking things up uh, right off the surface or just below the surface. Here are black-bellied plovers um, getting a, um, a, marine, a marine worm, pulling it up out of its little hole. This Wilson's plover um, used its heavy short bill uh, to basically snip off each one of the pinchers of this uh, crab uh, before eating the, the abdomen whole. buff of sandpipers are um, another one of those grass pipers, right? Um, and I've observed them feeding on many, many moths at Maumee Bay State Park when we were fortunate enough to have a, a group of five of them hanging out for about two weeks. <clears throat> Everybody's familiar with the um, sanderlings and how they chase waves at, at the beach um, and they're going to rush down uh, the beach to the water's edge and as the the water's receding you'll see little air bubbles coming up from the sand and uh, the sanderlings are getting right in there and trying to trying to dig up the little um, beach hoppers that are creating those uh, those bubbles and here we've got a couple of sanderlings that have managed to catch uh, some beach hoppers and we're going to zoom in and get a better look at the beach hopper here. But if anybody's ever tried to dig these up themselves, um, you got to be really, really quick. Um, you got to dig deep and, and pull up a bunch of sand in order to find uh, one of those beach hoppers. The phalaropes have a different uh, feeding strategy. They're no, well known for spinning on the water surface. They're going to spin rapidly and, and create a little vortex and, and pull the invertebrates up off the bottom of the tundra ponds. And then uh, they're going to jab at, at, the, um, at the bugs they've managed to draw up. And this one was actually, this red fowler rope was tipping like a, like a puddle duck, you know, trying to get to its food source. 
So migration takes a lot of uh, a lot of energy, and sometimes you'll see some shorebirds that are really packing on the pounds in preparation uh, for migration. This piping plover was uh, photographed at Metzger Marsh, and um, it was it was layered in fat for sure. As was this uh, sanderling. This is not uh, how we normally see sanderlings in Ohio. Usually they're they're shades of black and gray, but this one's in full breeding plumage. Um, in northern Michigan on its way to the breeding grounds. The sanderlings uh, and other shorebirds will defend feeding territories. Um, if there's another bird trying to compete for its space, they'll tip their wings and, and try to make some, themselves look bigger. Um, and they will, they will fight over a feeding territory just like they would say a breeding territory. It's a pair of semi-palmated sandpipers or um, semi-palmated plovers uh, fighting for, for feeding rights here. This series of images was uh, taken uh, by my friend Jamie Cunningham. And um, what you see here is a wimbrel um, getting into a bit of a, a dispute with this tiny little piping plover over here on the right. And the wimbrel just wants a place to relax and feed, but this is the piping plover's uh, breeding territory. So um, he's gonna try to fight off this great big wimbrel, probably close to 10 times his size. And eventually the piping plover uh, did drive this wimbrel right out of his uh, territory. Pretty amazing series uh, of images captured by, by Jamie there. Migration is uh, definitely taxing and uh, the birds have to have a little bit of extra uh, reserves for, um, for arrival on the breeding grounds because sometimes when they arrive, conditions aren't great for foraging and fattening up. Uh, so when the birds reach the, the North Slope uh, in Alaska, uh, they better have a little bit of uh, fat reserve because the ground and, and um, the ponds and everything can still be frozen when they, when they arrive. But when they arrive, they, they immediately um, set about um, setting up territories, defending territories, trying to attract a mate, um, and quickly uh, ra raise their young because the, the breeding season is so short. This is a, a golden plover, and it was actually involved in a, um, uh, territorial uh, dispute with another um, golden plover, and they were actually flying parallel uh, little sorties down their uh, territory boundary, which is pretty cool. A lot of the birds uh, will carry on in, in flight displays, um, and they're going to um, argue over territory with, with, their, um, with their neighboring uh, birds, but they'll also um, want to chase humans out of their, out of their territory. So um, I was actually in a kayak with the um, black neck stilt uh, wanting to yell at me. Um, I apparently was too close to, to its nesting grounds. Avocets, um, I've actually had them chase, um, chase me while I was walking along a road um, that just happened to go through a, a marsh where the birds must have been nesting close by. And they'll dive bomb. Uh, marbled godwits are famous also for attacking uh, humans. When we think of shorebirds, we really don't think of them being uh, birds that perch up on things, but uh, some of them do. Uh, snipe will display from fence posts and uh, other high, sp high spots as will lesser yellow legs on the breeding grounds. And um, this Hudsonian god was teed up on a uh, stunted black spruce uh, when, when I was in Churchill, Manitoba, uh, doing a wing up display, uh, trying to attract a mate. A lot of the shorebirds do interesting um, wing up displays. Uh, the Buff press the sandpipers, we'll talk more about them in a moment, but they're the ones that are probably the most known for uh, wing behavior, wing displays. 
Um, but Dunlin's uh, will definitely do a wing up display. This Dunlin was calling and uh, ended up marching with his wing up in the air until he found his uh, mate and they copulated. So pretty cool, pretty cool behavior. Uh, white rump sandpipers, I did not know that they did a wing display, um, but this bird was um, maintaining contact with, uh, with his uh, mate. We'd gotten between the, the male and the female. We didn't know the female was there. And I think uh, they were just trying to uh, kind of stay in, stay in touch. Don't go anywhere. I'm still here, baby. <clears throat> and the little semi-palmated sandpipers, um, totally non-obtrusive um, in migration on the mud flat, uh, quiet, unassuming. Um, and, and the breeding grounds are going to be uh, calling, uh, chasing females across the mud flats with their wings in the air, tail cocked, um, all kinds of craziness. And they do these little hover flights where they bound into the air and will hover for 30 or 45 seconds calling uh, the entire time. Um, and I've been able to get in position. And sometimes when the wind is strong, they'll even drift backwards. So as they were hovering, I wanted to try to, to do a slow motion uh, shot, a slow, a, a slow shutter speed shot. And uh, because the bird was just hanging almost uh, stationary, I was able to capture the, uh, the blurred wings. And then some of the behaviors uh, that I've witnessed aren't even in the literature. So um, on this particular day, there was a group of long-billed dowagers and one dowager would pick up a little stick and set it down, and another dowager would come uh, try to get that stick. So um, when that would happen, the, the two birds would, would start sparring, fighting, uh, clawing at each other, wing beating. And um, the next thing you know, one of the other dowagers would go to get that stick, and then two more birds would be fighting. And uh, the next day, what uh, what we encountered, um, there was all the, all the dowagers were paired up uh, on the tundra. Uh, they had just arrived in that flock the day before and did this, did this pair bonding, um, some kind of mate selection ritual over a, over a little stick. And um, I thought, man, this can be really cool to read about this behavior. And I can't, can't find anything in the literature uh, about this behavior in, in any shorebird. And uh, another behavior I've witnessed with uh, buff-breasted sandpipers that um, I've never seen anything uh, about it, the, um, I like to call it the trampoline display, but the um, buff-breasted sandpiper would bound into the air and drift back to the ground and then bound right back up. And he, he almost looked like he was jumping up and down on a trampoline. He'd go a few feet in the air, drop back down, and then, then spring right back up uh, repeatedly. And I was so dumbfounded because I'd never heard of this display. Um, I wasn't uh, wasn't smart enough to take any pictures. I was just uh, I was uh, just stunned and amazed and just watching. But the buff breasteds do the uh, uh, a double wing display. Uh, they they do lack uh, much like a grouse might. Um, so you got a bunch of birds uh, gathering for the display process. And, and here's the male uh, putting on his best show. The female's largely disinterested over here. And uh, a friend told me that the buff breasteds uh, had been known to display to people. And I, I hadn't given that another thought until I realized that, you know, midnight on the tundra, um, I just, I'm backing up. I'm constantly backing up because this bird's coming closer and closer to me. And um, then I realized, I remember that conversation. Um, and I do think this, this particular bird was dis displaying to me. This is the buff-breasted sandpiper uh, embrace. Uh, so you got a male um, showing off the underwings. You've got a, at least one female in there uh, inspecting those underwing linings. Um, and 
this may be two females in there, but also sometimes a, a, a second male will pose as a female uh, to come in and then try to break up uh, the embrace. So I'm not sure if the second bird is another female or, or possibly a second male. This is a nice, uh, nice little group of buff breasted uh, taken by Tyler Ficker. Uh, the rough is a is another uh, shorebird that that does lek. Um, you don't see the lecking behavior in in the states because there's just not enough of them. But in areas where rough are more common, they do um, again gather and, and display much like uh, you would see a sharp-tailed grouse lek. Uh, the rough's a, a good sized bird, and and this male was displaying. Uh, to a female pectoral sandpiper, uh, a much smaller bird, much to the chagrin of the of the male pectoral, for sure. But of all the crazy uh, shorebird behaviors, I, I think the pectoral sandpiper might be uh, might be my favorite. Uh, they just do a lot of uh, interesting and unique things. Um, they'll stand around, and display on their tiptoes with their chest puffed up. And they do a, just an amazing display flight. And I wanna share uh, the sound of that display flight with you. The first time I was in Alaska and I heard this call, I had no idea what it was. I, I had done my research and studied and uh, this was not a, a call I'd come, come across um, prior to getting there. So the first time I heard that, I wasn't sure what, what in the world was going on. It almost sounded like a, a spacecraft of some kind. Um, but what happens is the, the pectoral sandpiper will get on his little display mound and uh, he'll fly a, a sortie over top of a, a female uh, with his chest all pushed, uh, all pushed out, the air uh, sacs all inflated. And he'll uh, fly a repeated uh, course over top of the female, uh, making that uh, making that call. And the the sound that you heard actually coincides with this chest bouncing up and down as the bird flies along. And towards the end of the flight, uh, the the air sac starts to deflate, and it it starts to look, look a little sad, kind of like my spare tire um, hanging a little low. But the, uh, the pectorals also, uh, they do a parallel march uh, display. So this is two males at the edge of their territories. And they have a very, very specific and defined uh, territory boundary. And you dare not, dare not cross uh, onto the other's territory. So these guys were, were marching in, in unison uh, down, their, down their boundary line. Uh, but in addition to the wing, um, the display flights, they do wing up displays. Um, and here's a male trying to impress uh, the female that's trying to hide out in the grasses over here. So they're going to a lot of effort and putting putting forth a lot of energy to uh, to raise young, to to mate and. Um, lay that nest, uh, usually of four eggs. These are golden plover eggs, by the way. And uh, this is a black-bellied plover. Um, everybody's familiar with the fact that killdeer do a wing uh, distraction, uh, broken wing display. Um, the black-bellied plovers uh, do that as well uh, to try to lure a uh, predator away from the nest. And uh, they, they really rely on camouflage to, um, to successfully raise um, their young and, and incubate a nest. This is a red knot here. Uh, one of my participants, we had fanned out and we're walking uh, back towards the, the vehicle and he was about a half a step from, from uh, stepping on 
uh, this red knot. Uh, never saw it till the last second. And the, the bird actually never left uh, the nest. It relied on its camouflage and um, Chaz backed away and, and called everybody else over and we were able to photograph it respectfully from a distance and uh, she never got off the nest. The uh, fowl ropes, in addition to having a, a unique uh, feeding strategy, they, they have a very unique uh, breeding strategy as well. The, um, the females are the more boldly colored um, of, the, uh, of the pair. So the, the male is more drab, and that is because he's going to be the one that's going to incubate the eggs. And um, while he's incubating that, that nest, the female may go find another mate, um, may lay another clutch of eggs. Uh, so she, she could lay eggs equivalent of close to half of her body weight uh, in just a short period of time, and then leave all the, the rearing to, to the male. Uh, here's an avocet turning, turning the eggs. Uh, during the incubation process. And there's nothing much uh, cuter than avocet chicks. You see the egg tooth is still uh, visible on the tip of the bill, a little hardened uh, section to help the chicks peck their way out of those eggs. And they're pretty much uh, pretty self-sufficient almost immediately. One thing they do need is, is um, some help regulating their body temperatures. Uh, so when they're, when they're very young, they'll still spend time um, being brooded by, by the adult. And there's got a chick here and there's at least two or three more sets of legs um, underneath here. This is a Western sandpiper chick. Um, certainly within a couple of days of, of being hatched. And um, the success of, of the breeding shorebirds on the tundra has a lot to do with uh, the lemming population. And people wonder why I would have a lemming as part of my program with shorebirds. Well, if the lemming population is low, uh, these, these shorebird chicks become the bottom of the food chain. And uh, when the lemming population is high, these guys have a lot better chance at, at succeeding. So when the lemming population is, is, um, is healthy, that's good for the snowy owls. Uh, it's good for the glaucous gulls and the Arctic fox and some of the other predators like long-tailed Jaegers, parasitic and Pomeran Jaegers as well. Um, but when the, when the population of the lemmings is very low, then the, um, the songbirds and the shorebirds, uh, both the adults uh, and the young, as well as the eggs, are going to take a, take a beating. So the, the breeding success is, is much reduced when uh, that lemming population is, uh, is low. The uh, shorebirds have a variety of, uh, of strategies for avoiding predation and uh, camouflage is, is the greatest of these. Um, this surf bird, as I was photographing it, I looked down at the camera to ensure I had a good exposure and I looked back up, I couldn't see the surf bird. Uh, it was still there, it was just totally, uh, totally blended into its background. And the buff-rested sandpipers, uh, their, their golden uh, hues, blend very well with the drier tundra grasses where, where they tend to hang out. And the uh, ruddy turnstone is a fairly dark uh, shorebird. It's got a lot of blacks in it. And what I've noticed is that that bird's going to be in places where um, some of the tundra has upheaved and some of the black soils are exposed. Uh, it just blends into its surroundings there really well. Uh, the Dunlin's back looks just like the uh, the leaves from the um, scrub willow from the previous uh, fall. So they blend really well if there's a uh, raptor overhead. I actually witnessed a um, pectoral sandpiper lay flat to the ground and watch the sky. 
And I started scanning with binoculars and it took several minutes with 10X binoculars to find the peregrine falcon that was, even with the binoculars, it was a speck in the sky, but that pectoral had seen it, you know, naked eye long before I could find it. So they rely on that pattern, the camouflage to avoid detection. The, um, the woodcock has its eyes set up very high um, and well back so that it can see even when it's got its face uh, and bill shoved down into the mud. There's a snowy, uh, snowy plover blending very well on the white sand beach. So the, the shorebirds spend a, uh, a huge amount of time on feather maintenance. And they do so um, because most of them migrate uh, great distances. This uh, solitary sandpiper was engaged into a, in a really aggressive form of bathing. It was moving so quickly that I could not even really see what was happening other than it was just splashing around like crazy. And I cranked up the shutter speed and was able to get a few frames um, of the bird basically flying, running, and then just diving headfirst into the water, trying to coat its uh, feathers. Short-billed dowitcher doing some bathing here, splashing. And they're just trying to keep all these uh, feathers uh, clean and in, in good shape for uh, migration. After the, after the bath, a lot of times they'll flap and shake out some of the excess water drift back down to the earth before the preening session begins. And, um, you know, they're going to use the back of their head, their bill, their feet, um, whatever they have to do to get to every little nook and cranny uh, to help maintain uh, their feathers uh, for, their, for their long migrations. That, that must feel good, a little scratch on the chin. So um, when, they, when they're preening, they're also going to go after the oil gland at the base of the tail, and that's going to help with waterproofing and further maintaining the, uh, the feathers in peak condition. Here's a buff-breasted going for that oil gland as well. And they're going to rub that oil um, very meticulously over, over every feather. Same with the solitary. And uh, this is a, a stilt sandpiper. And what um, we're gonna talk a little bit about aging this uh, stilt sandpiper. So this is a first year bird, first fall. And we can tell that because of all the scalloped edging to the feathers here, uh, the nicely buff uh, lined uh, feathers giving this beautiful scalloped appearance. And then we see a few feathers in here that don't that aren't scalloped like that. So these are the first um, these. This is the first winter uh, plumage, the gray plumage coming in um, as the bird is starting to mold out its uh, its juvenile plumage. And uh, molt molt can be very irritating to birds. So when when they're molting, you'll see them spending even more time. Uh, with preening and, and taking care of their feathers. After a good preening session, a lot of times you'll, you'll see a bird do a wing stretch. And uh, if they stretch one wing, pay attention, they'll probably stretch, stretch the other wing. And uh, if they've already stretched both, a lot of times they will then stretch both of them together uh, with a double overhead uh, wing stretch all part of the preening process and, and getting the feathers to lay back um, in, into position. So the, uh, the migration of these shorebirds are really, really incredible. And uh, there's just a number of places where huge, huge uh, quantities of birds uh, gather. Uh, the Bay of Fundy uh, can hold up to 200,000 uh, semi-palmated sandpipers. The uh, um, San, Francisco, San Francisco Bay Area uh, can hold up to three quarters of a million uh, Western sandpipers uh, in migration. Just huge, huge numbers. Um, 
Delaware Bay is famous for its red knots uh, in migration. And uh, the Great Salt Lake uh, is well known for its Wilson's phalarope and redneck phalarope numbers. Um, they can have as many as half a million Wilsons, uh, 250,000 redneck phalaropes, uh, 250,000 avocets, um, all feeding on the brine shrimp on the Great Salt Lake. And uh, with huge numbers of birds like that, you can actually end up with uh, murmurations of, uh, of some of those shorebirds. This photo taken by um, Mia McPherson. The longer winged uh, birds tend to have the longer migrations. So Baird sandpipers fly far, as do curlew sandpipers. Hopefully a lot of you got to see this curlew sandpiper out in uh, Western Lucas County a few years ago in May. Um, the pectoral sandpipers have, have probably the longest uh, migration route of, of any of the shorebirds. Um, they can breed as far uh, north and west as uh, northern Siberia, and they travel to uh, all the way to southern Argentina at the tip of South America. Uh, so just a huge, huge distance these birds are, are covering. Wimbrels are um, migration champions as well. Um, they've been known to fly through hurricanes during fall migration. One bird that was fitted with a tracking device flew into Hurricane Irene in 2011. And she spent 27 hours flying into strong headwinds, traveling just nine miles per hour. Once she was through the eye, her uh, speed increased to almost 100 miles per hour, shooting out the backside of, of the hurricane. And the, the Wimbrels, a lot of them come out and fly out over the North Atlantic, and they're actually passing closer to Africa than they are to, um, to the North American coast on their way down to, uh, to South America. But the bar-tailed godwit is the, is the real champion migrant. Uh, bar-tailed godwits um, have been known to fly 7,500 miles nonstop from Alaska to New Zealand, um, taking 11 days to cover uh, 7,500 miles without uh, sleep, uh, water, food, all nonstop um, migration. A, a really an amazing feat uh, to, to think about. So they, they leave the Alaskan Peninsula towards Hawaii and then make a bend and head all the way down to New Zealand in one big nonstop flight. And I wanna share one last uh, story about this purple sandpiper. Um, I was at Whitefish Point and it was fairly early in the season for purple sandpiper. Um, the bird's not regular there at, at any time, uh, but usually not found before October. This was actually in uh, fairly early September. Uh, but this bird flew in uh, down, the, down the beach and, and dropped into a depression and hunkered down um, while a merlin went blasting by. And the, the bird uh, a few minutes later got up and flew off a little bit and came flying right back in and, and landed in my shadow um, to again hide from this Merlin that had circled back and, and was making another pass. And the, uh, the, the rest of the day, I think the bird just felt safe um, in my presence because I was constantly like trying to move further away from it to be able to photograph it, but it just wanted to be close to me because I, I really feel like the, it knew that the Merlin would not attack um, being so close to, to a human. So it was just kind of a, a, a really cool experience. And uh, with that, are there any questions out there? Hi, Brian. Hello. Hi, I just, I'm just in the process of getting unmuted. Yeah, I see, can you see the chat window? Cause there is at least one question in there. 
Um, I do want, don't have the chat window up. Do you want me to read it to you? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, it's from Cheryl. She says, are there any shorebirds of the same genus and species who live in different parts of the U.S. who exhibit any different behaviors from each other? Essentially, can the specific environment influence behavior? Wow. Um, I'm trying to think that one through to see if I can come up with any examples one way or the other. Uh, you know, the, the easy answer is I don't know. Um, that's a okay. great question. Okay. That's a great question. I'm not seeing any other questions here. I think um, we can still let people type those in, but do you want to go ahead and talk for a couple minutes about the um, trips that we had talked about with uh, Saber Wing for TNA? Yeah, absolutely, Kim. Um, I, I'm really excited that um, that that we're working, moving forward on um, on offering something for the membership at Toledo Naturalists Association uh, for a fundraising tour. And and I think what we've decided is the funds uh, would go towards the Sand Hill Crane Project, uh, which would be really cool. Um, we've done uh, fundraising tours with. A number of organizations in the past, and and the way it works is, uh, we we send out a survey uh, to the membership uh, with some suggested uh, tours, and uh, allow the members to to answer that survey and and kind of um, get get a get a feel for where where we might want to do one of these tours. So, uh, for example, um, these take about a year to to really get off the ground. And uh, so we're looking at 2023, and um, what we'll have is a survey that comes out with, with a future newsletter listing a handful of options of domestic uh, travels. And some of the locations that, uh, that we're thinking about are either like Maine or a uh, Minnesota winter tour, uh, maybe the Prairie Potholes or Arizo Southeast Arizona or South Texas. And uh, we want to list a handful of options and then allow everybody to, you know, pick their, say, top three. And from there, kind of see which, which places have, uh, have the most interest. And um, basically, at that point, we would have a, um, a group size minimum of six with a max of 10 to 12. Uh, we don't do really, really big groups. It's a better experience, I think, for everybody to, to have the smaller group um, tour. And um, if all goes well, then we could offer um, additional uh, fundraising tours uh, that might be, um, you know, maybe to Central, Central or South America. Um, you know, we'll, we'll start with a domestic offering first, I think. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. That's good. So that I think this is really the first that our members are hearing about that we've been planning this. And I know that uh, Dave Mallory is going to continue talking with you and Rob about, you know, getting this all planned. So thank you for that. Um, I'm seeing a couple more questions now coming in the chat. Are you still willing to do that? Absolutely. Okay. Um, from Jean, she says she's in New Zealand. And she says the birds you're talking about, are they found on the shores of Lake Erie or do you go to the seacoast to see them? As New Zealand has a massive coastline, it's hard to imagine shorebirds not on the seashore. So um, a lot of the behavior photographs that, um, that I was talking about breeding behaviors, um, much of that was uh, taken in Northern Alaska, uh, not too far from the Arctic Ocean, um, but a lot of the, uh, a lot of the other uh, behavioral shots uh, would be in, in um, some of the wildlife areas adjacent uh, to Lake Erie. Um, some of the uh, little bit of mud flats that show up in the marshes there um, or along the coast. Um, a number of the images were taken up at Whitefish Point, which is on Lake Superior, uh, which is a huge inland lake. Um, so it's, it may not be a seacoast like she has in mind, but but Lake Superior is is a very, very, very big lake. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I see another question from Tom Sheehan. He says, uh, I didn't understand the effect of lemmings on shorebirds. Don't lemmings feed on the birds' eggs, driving the bird population down? 
Uh, lemmings, no, they do not feed on uh, eggs. Uh, lemmings are, um, they're eating a lot, a lot of grasses and herbs, um, vegetarians. Um, so what's, what's happening is when the, when the shorebird number, I'm sorry, when the lemming um, population is high, the, um, the shorebirds are not being harassed by the predators uh, because the predators are focused on the lemmings, which is the typical um, base of the food chain there. Um, if the lemmings aren't there, then the shorebirds kind of replace the lemmings at the base of that food chain and uh, things don't go so well for them as far as breeding and, and raising the young and, and all of that. <laughs> okay, um, I'm not seeing any more questions, but I'm seeing a lot of people thanking you for a wonderful program and uh, sounds like everyone's saying it was really exciting and interesting. So I think we'll stop with the questions if you're okay with that. Sounds good. Okay, so thank you again, Brian, and I uh, hope you get some rest, and we appreciate you being here.